Hello, and welcome to Polygraph. Thanks for joining us for this week's investigation. Located in Virginia, the Colonial Parkway stretches for 23 miles across three distinct historic and colonial settlements. Jamestown was the first established English colony in America around the year 1607. In the early 1920s, there was fear the conditions of such historic places were reaching a point of being irreparable and needed to be designated as historic landmarks. With that in mind, an idea was proposed to connect Virginia's historic triangle, and thus the Colonial Parkway was constructed, linking these historic treasures to one another across preserved forests and wetland areas. However, the Colonial Parkway became more than just a route for tourists. Teens and young couples were drawn to the long stretches of poorly lit road and dark scenic overlooks to enjoy some quiet time together, and in the late 80s, it became the home of a killer. While the separate incidents weren't immediately connected, the public became aware that a killer was operating in the area and taking the lives of young adults, and even worse, they've never been caught. This is the case of the Colonial Parkway Murders. On October 12th, 1986, which happened to fall on Columbus Day, a jogger out for an early Sunday morning run spotted something odd. As they approached the Cheatham Annex Overlook, roughly about seven miles outside Williamsburg, they saw what appeared to be a vehicle down an embankment. The vehicle had appeared to veer off the edge and into a thicket, impeding it from dropping into the York River. The jogger assumed the car must have been driven by a drunk driver, and fearing there was still someone in the vehicle, flagged down a highway patrolman. The patrolman navigated his way down to the wreck and discovered the bodies of two individuals, both female. They were later identified as 27-year-old Naval Academy graduate Kathy Thomas and 21-year-old College of William & Mary senior Becky Andowski. The couple had been reported missing as they had not been seen since the evening of October 9th, leaving the computer lab of William & Mary College. Upon investigation, something stuck out. What appeared to be a case of drunk driving developed quickly into a double homicide investigation. Autopsy revealed both victims had rope burns across their necks as well as their wrists. They both had their throats slit, so deep that they had been nearly decapitated. It was also revealed that both the vehicle and the victims had been covered in gasoline, though there was no indication it had been ignited or attempted to be. Becky's body had been found in the hatch of the vehicle while Kathy's had been located in the back seat. It appeared Kathy had struggled with the attacker as clumps of hair were found in between her fingers. There were also latent prints found across the vehicle as well as the victims, 150 in total, though records were unable to be matched to them. Sexual assault was not evident, nor was an attempt to rob the victims, as both of the victims' purses were found intact with the vehicle. It is believed that the murders may have taken place elsewhere, and then dumped where they were found since the car had little blood within it. In reports, the overlook was popular between the couple and not out of the way of their usual routine, but with little to go on, the case quickly went cold. Almost one year after the horrific discovery of Kathy and Becky's murders, history began to repeat itself. On September 21st, 1987, a patrolling officer spotted a running vehicle in the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge. The black Ford Ranger seemed to be left running with its lights, wipers, and radio left on. Articles of clothing were inside, as well as a man's wallet, belonging to David Lee Nobley, 20 years old. David was a salesman from Virginia, but he had not been seen since September 19th. His father had got a search party together and began searching for David, starting from the vehicle and following the river downstream. On September 23rd, roughly two miles from the abandoned vehicle, the body of David was located, as well as the body of a young female, roughly 100 yards from one another. Their bodies had been washed ashore due to the tide. Both victims had been shot in the head, with David having an additional wound to his shoulder, in what would appear to be an attempt to flee. The body of the female was found to be 14-year-old Robin Edwards, Robin was an 8th grade student at Huntington Middle School and had been engaged in a relationship with David despite her being a minor, and David being 6 years her senior. David also had a girlfriend who was pregnant at the time, but despite that, he was able to convince Robin to sneak out of her house the night they disappeared. Both victims were partially clothed. Robin had her pants unbuttoned and her bra had been wrapped around her neck, most likely in an attempt to strangle. Sexual assault was hard to determine as it was believed the relationship between David and Robin was sexual, though there is no information as to why they had met up other than speculation. Interestingly, 
After finding out that the black Ford Ranger belonged to David, police inspected it again and noticed the driver's side window rode halfway down, implying that the killer could be impersonating the police officer. In time, the case was linked to that of Kathy and Becky, as they were both couples murdered at Lover's Lanes, just 30 minutes in distance from each other, despite the method of killing being varied. That following spring, on April 9, 1988, 20-year-old Richard Keith Call was busy preparing for his first date with 18-year-old Cassandra Lee Haley. Both were students at Christopher Newport University, located in Newport News, and this was to be Keith's first date since breaking up with his girlfriend of four years, months earlier. The two planned to spend the day together, and Keith arrived in his red 1982 Toyota Celica to pick up Cassandra before heading into town. The couple was last spotted attending a party in the University Square area of Newport News, roughly around 1.30 a.m. When the pair failed to return to their respective homes after the date, they were reported missing on the morning of April 10th. Around 7 a.m. that same morning, Keith's unoccupied vehicle was spotted on the York River Overlook off the Colonial Parkway, near Yorktown, Virginia. However, it wasn't reported until roughly 9 a.m. Upon investigation, nothing seemed to be disturbed. The keys of the vehicle were left on the passenger seat with Keith's watch and glasses on the dashboard. Almost all of the clothing Keith had been wearing was in the back seat, including his underwear, as were some of Cassandra's clothes and her underwear. Police were able to confirm it was indeed the clothing they wore the night they went missing, but both Keith's wallet and Cassandra's purse were missing, each containing roughly $20 in cash. Unlike the other linked cases, the bodies of Cassandra and Keith were not in the vehicle or found in the water. In fact, their bodies have never been recovered. Scent dogs led investigators from the car to the banks of the York River, but subsequent searches never provided any leads. It was speculated that the pair had perhaps pulled over to go for a late night swim, but the evidence for this theory cannot be corroborated. It's also important to note that the temperature outside was in the mid-40s, which isn't necessarily swimming weather. The pair also had no reason to stop along the parkway after leaving the party at 1.30 a.m., as Cassandra had a curfew of 2 a.m., and she was always insistent on being prompt. Extensive searches went up and down the river, but the pair is still missing to this day. Foul play is suspected, and given the location and fact that there was a couple, has linked this case to the Colonial Parkway murders. By this point, the parkway had become quite a spooky place to the locals. Most would not be caught there after dusk, and parents warned their children to avoid the area and under no circumstances go to any secluded overlooks after dark. However, it wouldn't be long until it happened again. Just under a year and a half after the disappearance of Keith and Cassandra, another vehicle was found abandoned at a rest area off Route 64. A gold 1972 Chevy Nova had been left at the rest area with its doors unlocked and the keys in the ignition. Dirt and grass was visible on the underside of the vehicle, suggesting it had been driven off-road at some point. A purse was located in the back seat belonging to 18-year-old Anna Maria Phelps. The car, however, belonged to 21-year-old Daniel Lauer, neither of whom were located at the scene. After some investigation, it was revealed that Lauer was in the process of moving to Virginia Beach from Amelia County, just south of Richmond, to stay with his younger brother, who was dating Phelps at the time. Phelps and Lauer's younger brother had some difficulty with their financials, and Lauer had offered to move in and assist monetary-wise. Not wanting to make the drive himself to retrieve his belongings, Phelps had offered to go with him and help. The pair had been traveling back from Amelia County since 11 p.m., heading in the eastbound direction towards Virginia Beach. However, when the car was located on September 5th, it was headed in the westbound direction, away from Virginia Beach. The car was also not positioned in the car parking lot, it had been left in the truck lot for big rigs off the on-ramp heading back onto I-64, halfway on the shoulder and halfway in the road. Police were initially skeptical of linking this disappearance to the Colonial Parkway murders. In fact, it was the last thing anyone wanted, but given the circumstance, it was hard to ignore the similarities. Six long weeks passed by and the police were finally able to make the connection between the disappearance of Lauer and Phelps to the Colonial Parkway murders. Hunters had come across the remains of two people, wrapped in an electric blanket, roughly one mile from the rest area off of I-64. After some investigation, it was found they were the remains of Phelps and Lauer. The remains were badly decomposed and mostly skeletal. No cause of death could be immediately determined. However, marks on the ribs and abdomen of Phelps indicated she had been stabbed to death. Police presumed Lauer was probably murdered the same way. Even with the recovery of the bodies, the police were stumped in terms of finding the killer. 
but the similarities in this case compared to that of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley were very compelling. Comparing the two cases, they tell us a lot about who the perpetrator was, or at least how they operate. It would seem in both cases, the cars were purposely staged in areas where the killer wanted it to be found or seen, perhaps a taunt to the authorities. The game for the killer is leading police on a hunt for the occupants of those vehicles. In the case of Keith and Cassandra, they were successful in the fact that the bodies were never recovered. In the case of Lauer and Phelps, the killer lost, as the bodies were recovered eventually, even in such a dense and remote area. It's often thought that the violence of the crimes took place elsewhere, and then the cars were placed as bait to lead the police on the hunt for victims. Although it is unknown how Keith's red Celica ended up at the Overlook, we can safely assume how Lauer's Chevy Nova ended up in the westbound direction rest area parking lot. Lauer and Phelps must have pulled over around 1 or 2 a.m. for a break. The killer then approached the pair, and at gunpoint, or with some other way of convincing, led them back onto I-64 in the Chevy Nova, off exit 155, and then onto the remote road where the murders then took place. The killer then got back into the Chevy Nova, left the vehicle in the lot of the rest area, and had either left their own vehicle there, or across the highway in the eastbound lot where the initial confrontation took place. There is also the speculation that this could be a pair of individuals, one doing the driving, the other apprehending the victims. We also see in the case of David Dobling that it's possible the suspect impersonated police to get cooperation out of their victims. Oddly enough though, just as police and the feds began to link the cases and uncover their MO, the killing seemed to have stopped. In 1992, with more than two years without any Parkway murders, the feds believed that the killer had either stopped altogether, which is often unlikely, moved to a different part of the country, had died, or was incarcerated by another crime. While there has never been a suspect named in any of the cases listed, there have been some other victims that have potential links to the Colonial Parkway murders, but have never been conclusively listed as such. Some believe the 1984 murders of Mike Margaret and Donna Hall are the first victims of the Colonial Parkway murders. Mike and Donna were engaged to be married, and had been in a relationship for over four years since high school. The couple resided in Richmond, Virginia, and had told their families they intended on having a camping trip the weekend of August 17th. This was the last time the couple was seen. Three days later, a retired dentist walking in the woods not far from where Mike and Donna lived came across Mike's Jeep. The keys were left in the ignition and the doors opened. A trail of blood led to the deceased bodies of Mike and Donna, which were found under a checkered blanket, similar to how Lauer and Phelps were found. The couple had several stab wounds, and their throats were slit, in a similar manner to that of Kathy Thomas or Rebecca Dowski, the canonical first case linked to the Parkway murders. The coroner determined that they had been killed around 2 a.m. on August 18th, just hours after they were last seen. Interestingly, the toxicology report found both victims had levels of Demerol in their systems, a narcotic sedative, with Donna having a much higher amount than Mike. The similarities match closely to the modus operandi of the Parkway killer. The victims were left under a blanket, in a remote area, with their car staged nearby. A red bandana was left hanging from the rearview mirror, similar to the roach clip that belonged to Phelps left hanging in the gold Chevy Nova years later. The difference here is the Demerol. Perhaps this was a killer, or killer's first time, and they felt the need to sedate the victims to make it easier for them to commit the heinous act. Other possible crimes linked to the Parkway Killer are the 1988 murders of Brian Pettinger and Laurie Powell. Though not a couple, but rather separate attacks, they took place just one month from the other. Brian Pettinger was last seen leaving a dance club on December 4, 1987, around 11.30 p.m. On February 3, 1988, his corpse would be found floating in a marshy area of the James River, located in Suffolk, Virginia. His ankles and wrists were bound with a rope found around his neck, presumably hogtied at one point. He had been thrown in the river alive, and the cause of death was drowning, though he had suffered repeated blows to the back of his head. There are no leads or suspects in his case. As for 18-year-old Lori Powell, her remains too were found floating in the James River, not far from Ragged Island, close to where the bodies of Edwards and Nobling had been found. She was with her boyfriend on March 8, 1988, and the couple had gotten into a dispute. Laurie left the vehicle and began walking down Route 614 towards Route 17 in Portsmouth, Virginia. She was reported missing on March 10th after failing to show for her scheduled shift at work that morning. On April 2nd, her body was found in the river, again not far from Ragged Island. She was nude, no bindings, 
but covered with multiple stab wounds to her back. Even with the multiple stab wounds to her back, Laurie's cause of death could not be determined, nor where it had taken place. The connection between these two killings and the Parkway murders brings us back to Ragged Island and the Nobling and Edwards murders. Though these were separate incidents, the geography fits the MO, even with the manner of death being varied. To add more circumstantial evidence to the case, Brian Pettinger worked at the same security agency that Laurie worked for, though the pair was never reported to have dated. This security agency is the same agency that employed Robin Edwards' mother, and all three victims were found in the same river, not far from Ragged Island. This is what brings us to one of the only suspects in the case, Ronald Little, who for whatever reason seemed to implicate himself in the crimes. Ron Little was a New Zealand native living illegally in the U.S. in 1988. He was a part owner of the Liberty Security Agency, which later changed its name to Advanced Security. After the murders and recovery of both Brian Pettinger and Laurie Powell, Little took it upon himself to draft a six-page letter and send copies to 14 different outlets, including then-President George H.W. Bush. In the letter, Little primarily points out the issue he is facing with Immigration Services and their desire to deport him. At one point, Little discusses the murders and the connections to a security agency. Little says he was involved in the search for Penninger as well as Powell, and said that the bodies would most likely end up in the James River, which they did. Little was questioned by the local police as well as the FBI and in 1989, to avoid several weapons charges, was deported back to New Zealand. Little had a record in New Zealand as well, mainly for robbery and possession and upon moving back changed his name several times or used aliases to cover his real name to avoid bad press. Little died in the early 2000s under a different name, though he had several social media accounts using his different aliases. It really is tough to say what, if any, involvement Little played in the murders, though the FBI was competent enough to write him off as a suspect and deport him in the process. In the case of Brian Pettinger, an unknown suspect was questioned by the FBI as well. This unnamed suspect denied being with Penninger the night he was missing, but it was later discovered he left the dance club with him. Unfortunately, the suspect later committed suicide, and in his note stated, quote, I did not leave any clues behind, so don't feel guilty, end quote. The name of the suspect has still not been disclosed. In recent years, the FBI has had little news regarding the case. Due to a push from the victim's families, the case was reopened in 2010, and in 2018, three out of the four canonical crime scenes were tested for DNA, though there is no information as to what came of the DNA. When reviewing the Lauer and Phelps case, which would be the last of the canonical murders, something was discovered which seemed to be breezed over back in 1988. A note was found in Anna Phelps' possessions, dated with the night they went missing. On it were instructions with a location and time that matched with the rest stop on I-64 at the same time the pair were to be traveling. The note mentioned a blue van and had a number on it, implying that the stop at the rest area was not random, but planned. Detectives from 1989 say they were never aware of this note, but the family insists police were in possession and handed all the belongings of Phelps back as the case became cold. As of right now, the FBI says there is a list of over 130 suspects that could possibly be implicated in the killings, but that just shows exactly what they're up against. There is not enough information to link any one of them conclusively and none besides Little have been directly linked in such a manner. Though we may not have a list of suspects to pluck from and match to the cases, what we do have are the crime scenes themselves, and in an attempt to aid the investigation, we can assemble a rough profile of the killer or killers. Please keep in mind, we are not trained profilers, and this is strictly an opinion based on analysis of the crimes. Let's start by acknowledging that double homicides are usually rare, to have so many double homicides in a 60 mile radius is extremely peculiar. The fact that all the victims, minus Kathy Thomas, were in their early 20s or teens and in secluded areas also points to the idea that these are all linked. In almost all cases, the driver's side window is rolled partially down or all the way down, and the Walder ID of the victim is visible on the seat or floor. This would imply that the victims were under the impression they were dealing with law enforcement. This could also be why, if it were one killer, they were able to control two different victims, using their position of authority to make the victims comply. In each case, the vehicles appear to be staged in the hopes that they would be found. Kathy's vehicle in the first case was pushed down an embankment where it became stuck. There was then an attempt to ignite the diesel fuel poured over the vehicle, but this too didn't work. 
This looks more like it's to draw attention to the crime as opposed to trying to cover up the crime. A car in the river set on fire would be easily noticed. In the second crime, David's black Ford Ranger was left with the lights, radio, and wipers on, seemingly to draw attention to the vehicle. In the third case, Keith Call's red Toyota Celica was left visible on a popular section of the parkway, awaiting a curious passerby to spot it. And in the fourth case, Daniel Lauer's gold Chevy Nova was left on the on-ramp of the rest area, partially on the shoulder and in the lane, disrupting traffic where it was easily noticeable and in the way. These are all telltale signs the killer or killers are bringing attention to their crimes. But other than case number one, the bodies were left elsewhere. It would seem the killer is playing a game, leaving the cars in an area where they can be found, but the bodies of the victims elsewhere for the police to find. It's an active taunt of a cold, evil, and calculated killer, not only getting off on multiple murders, but seeing their crimes in the press and enjoying the frantic searches to find his victims. One could also speculate that the killer or killers has a disdain for young romance, or some sort of, quote, moral enforcer, end quote. When it comes to Kathy and Becky, the killer did far more damage to Kathy than they did Becky. Some would say it's overkill, almost like it was personal. The couple was known to go to the Overlook on Thursday nights, and it's possible the killer knew the couple and targeted them specifically based on having a disdain towards their sexuality. In the case of David and Robin, we know that David seemed to have desires for underage women. His pregnant girlfriend at the time was just 16, and Robin Edwards was just 14. The killer could have known this one way or another, and used this to fuel his murder spree. It's unfortunate for Robin she was caught in the middle of this scenario. In the third case, Keith and Cassandra were young and good-looking. Cassandra even modeled part-time while Keith drove a flashy red car. The killer could have seen the pair and it sparked some sort of jealousy within them, possibly because they weren't able to have that themselves. In the fourth case, Daniel and Anna weren't dating. But perhaps the killer knew this, and had thought there was something else going on, once again fueling his anger towards romance. Daniel's younger brother, Anna's boyfriend, has stated she told him not to come for the trip as he had school the next day. He even said it was the first day of school and nothing would be happening, but Anna insisted he intend. We don't want to imply that there was anything going on between Daniel and Anna, however it does seem strange for such a late night trip to move your boyfriend's brother from one place to another not to mention the note found in Anna's belongings implying they were to meet someone else that fateful night at the rest area, all while her boyfriend was unaware. The killer, or killers, are most definitely male in our opinion, either an active law enforcement or impersonating law enforcement, most likely police or park rangers, possibly private security. Essentially anyone believable enough with lights on their vehicle and carrying a flashlight and a gun. This male would have to be somewhat strong in order to dominate his victims, and also push a car over an embankment, as was the case with Kathy and Becky. However, they may be on the smaller side, as most of the male victims were roughly six foot tall. This person is probably not very social, unmarried, or has relationship problems. They would likely be slightly older than the victims or middle-aged, but familiar enough with the territory to know the local hangout spots and lovers' lanes. Furthermore, the killer would need to be well-versed in investigations in order to avoid detection with basic fingerprinting and crime scene analysis. There wouldn't be anyone better to set up a staged crime scene than someone who works on them. In the case of two killers, the profile is pretty much the same. The difference would be that one dominates the other. One is in control, and the other follows. This would make controlling two victims easier, as well as staging the vehicles and getting away from the scene of the crime. In a lot of these cases, it's presumed the murders take place elsewhere and the cars are then moved. If this is the case, an accomplice would make moving the bodies and staging of the vehicles much easier. We see this in the fourth case with Lauer's vehicle switching directions on I-64. It could be possible one was locked up or passed away, causing the other to stop, not comfortable enough to operate without their accomplice. It is our own opinion, however, that the killer operates alone and enjoys the thrill of having power over his victims and over law enforcement. Unfortunately for this case, there's not much to go on any longer. From our understanding, there is little the public is not aware of regarding the crimes. The FBI still has it as an open investigation, and they continue to pursue leads. DNA testing is constantly reaching new heights, and could one day possibly lead us to a killer. But it's also a possibility these cases aren't related at all. When reviewing the crimes and seeing the similarities, we want to believe that this is one suspect responsible 
but there are a lot of other signs that they could all just be coincidence, perpetrated by different individuals. Polygraph hopes that one day, Keith Call and Cassandra Haley are found, and perhaps this could lead to new insights into the case. But as of now, it continues to be a mystery. If you, or anyone you know, has information regarding any of the cases mentioned in today's investigation, please call Crime Stoppers. Perhaps you hold the information that could find a killer.